Great, thank you, Rina. Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, such a pleasure to be here, uh, not physically, virtually. Uh, physically, I'm coming to you from sunny Montgomery, Alabama of USA. Uh, well, I should uh, uh, qualify myself as an uh, outsider looking in. Uh, my training is more in numerical analysis. Uh, this is more of a, uh, so this talk more uh, document my experience in finding very surprising answers to applied problem in abstractly defined lattice polytope and seeing interesting and sometimes uh, unexpected connections. Uh, certainly we, uh, in this talk, I will cover some joint work with my collaborators, uh, Rob Davis, who is a uh, uh, discrete geometer, my former student, Evgenia, uh, Julie Limberg is, um, well, I guess she has a PhD in uh, electrical engineering, but she's more a, a mathematician now, and my engineering friends, uh, Jacob Dagesh and Matthew. Uh, and this, uh, some of this work are also inspired by an uh, uh, interesting discussion uh, uh, took place in a special session from last year's uh, AMS special session that we organized. We brought together researchers from discrete geometry, numerical analysis, and uh, uh, most importantly, e electric engineering. So the group of people that normally don't see each other. We had some interesting discussion and um, that was a virtual uh, meeting. I certainly hope to replicate this experience uh, in person someday. Uh, uh, I guess we're doing the same here <laughs> uh, virtually. Uh, so maybe I should start with the definition of a uh, symmetric edge, edge polytope, which will be uh, sort of the main character, well, one of the main character here. Uh, so we start with the graph. Uh, the symmetric edge polytope is defined to be the convex hull of uh, line segments uh, that are derived from edges. So for each edge, you have a line segment, so a pair of points. Uh, symmetric about the origin. Uh, so you have line segment going through the origin, but sticking out in the uh, coordinate planes determined by the edges. Uh, now, the first, the earliest paper I can find this is the, the paper titled The Root, Roots of Earhart Polynomial Arising from Graphs. Uh, I, I cannot claim uh, this is definitely the, the first one. I certainly remember seeing something uh, like this uh, elsewhere earlier. After all, this is a generalization of the root system polynomial of type uh, AN. If you just take the um, complete graph, uh, well, you have the, exactly the root system polytope. So it's a natural uh, generalization. Uh, to see a simple example, let's look at K3, uh, which also C3. We have three edges. Uh, those three edges give you three line segments through the origin. I'm projecting down this to the two-dimensional plane. Uh, otherwise, they naturally live uh, uh, in the three-dimensional space. Uh, this just makes my drawing a little bit easier. If we take the convex hull, we get this ni nice uh, hexagon. Uh, that has some obvious uh, symmetry. Uh, we can see that from the definition. Uh, so again, I'm taking the convex hull of those six points. I'm fixing E0 to be zero, just so that we are uh, in R2. Now, otherwise, the, the symmetric edge polytope will be a polygon, will be a hexagon uh, floating in space. Uh, so some of the early interest probably came from number theory, uh, but certainly we have found uh, application elsewhere. And, and that's why uh, well, we have this, this talk. Uh, a lot is known about this family of poly symmetric edge polytopes uh, derived from graphs, uh, starting from some basic properties. Uh, if you have a connected symbol graph of n plus one nodes, then uh, the symmetric edge polytope is n-dimensional. Uh, so that's why I always use n plus one node this way uh, is uh, itself uh, living in dimensional space. 
Uh, it's a reflexive, so it's the walls also lattice. Uh, there, the, there's some nice symmetry between the facial compact compasses and um, uh, subgraphs uh, of uh, the graph you start with, G. Uh, in particular, uh, to just give some examples, the, the facets actually correspond to the uh, maximum bipartite subgraphs of uh, G. So there's some uh, nice parameterization of the facial complex uh, using the subgraphs of G. Uh, for certain families of graphs, but not all, uh, just, just a few families, uh, the normalized volume are given explicit formula. Uh, for example, trees, complete graphs, cycles, wheel graphs, uh, graphs formed by cycles, glued along edges, and uh, many more. Uh, we don't have to stay with the symmetric version. We can actually uh, construct the uh, directed version. I have seen this term used in places, but certainly not as common as the symmetric edge polytope. If you start from a diagraph or even a, a finite quiver, you'll get the same thing. Uh, we can define this uh, directed, so not symmetric anymore, directed edge polytope to be, um, oh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the this is a typo. I, I don't want that to be there. Oh, very sorry about that. I guess I copy and paste from the previous slide. Uh, so you can just uh, take the convex hull of, sorry, no more plus or minus, uh, just EI minus EJ, depending on the direction of the edges. Now, I prefer to include the origin so that at least you have some full dimensional object, but that's optional. Uh, just to see one example, starting from this diagraph, you only get three points, two points from the two edges and the origin. If you take the convex hull, you'd get this uh, dark triangle. Now, this is important. Uh, as you can see here, this is actually how we describe the simplices or cells inside the symmetric edge polytope. So this version, the direct version is always uh, in the discussion we have here, uh, although we'll not use this directly, but in all the proofs, uh, they do show up. Uh, okay, now switch gear a little bit. Uh, let me introduce uh, the, the other main character in this talk, uh, the crew model model. Uh, so this is, I would say, the standard model, at least for many decades, the standard model for studying uh, spontaneous synchronization in networks of weakly coupled oscillators. Uh, it started in 1975 by uh, Kuramoto, uh, hence the name. Certainly the study of network of oscillators uh, go back many decades uh, further. Uh, so originally, it is a model for chemical and the biological oscillators, which are not exactly easy to understand. Uh, so we can consider this a uh, more mechanical model. Uh, so we can visualize some massless particles uh, going around, uh, rotating on the unit circle but they're coupled with one another via springs. So as they run around the circles, they will push and pull on one another. And that's what makes it interesting. So it's a simple model. Uh, for us to understand the crew model model, it is not original motivation. Uh, so each particle has its own natural frequency. So natural angular velocity, if we cut those springs, each one has its own preferred uh, velocity to go around the, the, the circle. Um, but when we uh, connect the, the springs, uh, interesting start to happen. Now, crew model isolate one special uh, coupling interaction. So uh, we use the, 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 the strings function uh, to be proportional to the sign of phase difference. Uh, so this is a very special choice. Uh, you can certainly model the, the spring in a number of different ways, a crow model chose the simple function psi. It turns out to be a nice choice, as we'll see. Uh, the original focus was uniform and all-to-all -all coupling, uh, but certainly, uh, at, well, as we can see from this picture, uh, non-uniform and sparse network can also be considered. In this example, I don't have all the uh, edges 
in K4. I have a four cycle, for example. Uh, a, this model is actually used to model very real things in real world. Uh, the most famous example is probably the flashing cycle of fireflies. Uh, we can model the cycle as points on the unit circle. So we can imagine a point going around the circle at a certain um, point, the firefly will light up and it will take a break in the, in the, on the right side of the, the, the circle. So we go round and round and they have a natural, natural flashing cycle. Uh, a core model, well, and also other scientists use uh, this system equation to model this uh, very simple equation to model this behavior. And uh, I explained the, uh, the things here. Uh, theta is the face of its of each firefly's uh, flashing cycle. So for each uh, uh, firefly, we have a theta i. Uh, that angle tells us where it is in the uh, flashing cycle. Uh, omega i is its natural frequency. So maybe each uh, firefly has its own natural tendency. Some like to flash quick, some like to flash slow. That's quite possible, some natural biological variance. And KIJ described the coupling. Uh, so basically how strongly they influence one another. So here the graph doesn't have to be, the network doesn't have to be dense, doesn't have to com complete. It is possible uh, some fireflies don't see some other fireflies. So here IJ are adjacent if they can uh, influence each other. <clears throat> uh, some species of fireflies can actually synchronize and I have seen this uh, in person, it's mesmerizing. Uh, you can imagine a, a, a night in a, in a valley, uh, thousands or tens of thousands, fireflies synchronize, make a pretty good show. Uh, they can actually synchronize sometimes to the e exact same frequency. Uh, as we'll uh, define carefully later, this is called the frequency synchronization. Uh, well, actually we found the model model everywhere, uh, or at least almost everywhere. The same, same equation keeps showing up in different places, um, maybe for good reasons, or maybe because we have a hammer and then everything looks like nail. We certainly find this in biological oscillators. That's the original uh, motivation in the study of heart cells in brain cells. Uh, the fact that we have a heartbeat or brain wave certainly means our cells are synchronized in a very special way. Um, well, we have to thank this equation uh, to be alive and be able to think. Uh, in the age of uh, autonomous, autonomous vehicle, uh, this equation is used um, <laughs> in coordinate uh, vehicles. Uh, for flying drone or drones, uh, swarm formation, if you write down carefully, you get a very similar equation. In electro engineering, I think for completely unrelated reasons, if you write down the Kirchhoff uh, voltage and the current law together as a system equation, you get something almost identical under certain conditions. Uh, well, uh, and in, uh, well, I guess electronics, one of the early examples I, I saw is a clock synchronization problem, which used to be a big problem in the, in, in the early 2000s. Uh, so I found a lot of this information uh, from a very helpful uh, recent survey, not so recent anymore from 2014, uh, but still probably the, the best survey we have so far. Uh, so this is the equation that will show up in almost every slide. Uh, let's call this the, the, the core model differential equation that describes this um, uh, network of oscillators. Uh, my interpretation, uh, this, this may not be correct everywhere uh, is, uh, so those three terms uh, on the left-hand side, the theta can be interpreted as, well, it is the angular velocity of an oscillator. On the right-hand side, we have a tug of war. We have its own natural frequency, so its own tendency of going its own way <clears throat> against the summation of influence from all its neighbors. So there's, there's a tug of war going on and uh, uh, we expect sometimes these two sides can reach an equilibrium 
and uh, we'll define carefully what that means. That's one form of synchronization. Uh, so here's a, simula a simulation. So if, okay, I let this run. Uh, we can see we have oscillators going around the circle. Right now, they're each just doing its own thing. Uh, some decide to go slow, some decide to go fast. Uh, so that's uncoupled oscillators each doing its own thing on the unit circle. Now, as soon as I couple them, uh, some interesting dynamics start to happen. Um, sometimes they may reach synchronization, sometimes they may not. So it looks like this case is not exactly synchronization in the sense that even though those three are sort of close together in the phase, uh, going around the circle roughly in the same pace, the blue one decide to not go long. Uh, if I increase the coupling scalar, uh, so basically make the springs um, uh, connecting them stronger, you can see they uh, at least uh, roughly reach uh, frequency synchronization, frequency synchronization in the sense that they can go around the circle at the same angular velocity, i.e. the same frequency. Now, even though this looks like a dynamic picture, it's actually static. If I just uh, fix a rotational frame of reference, basically I fix my camera to, to the red node. Um, um, so they're still moving. Uh, we just fix a rotational frame of reference. They actually appear to be uh, static. So even though this came from a dynamic system, <clears throat> once they reach uh, frequency synchronization, we're actually looking at the, a uh, um, static picture. Let me stop this. Also, let's define this frequency synchronization carefully. So again, this is the differential equation. Uh, so one core, core problem in this study is the frequency synchronization. Uh, I can describe this as the tendency of oscillator relaxing to their limit cycle and the influence of their neighbor reach some kind of equilibrium. Um, if that happens, the oscillator are all tuned to their mean frequency. Uh, so here, tuned to their mean frequency is not part of the definition. If they synchronize at all, they have to synchronize at their mean frequency just because how this equation is set up. <clears throat> so I, I should mention there are several distinct uh, notion of synchronization, their phase synchronization, phase cohesion, and many others, they're all very different. Uh, here, we only talk about uh, frequency synchronization, <clears throat> uh, which means all the angular velocity are tuned to a mean frequency, let's call that omega bar. So omegas are the natural frequency, they take bar, that's their mean natural frequency uh, for all of them. Now, if you write down these two sides of the equation, put them, uh, set them equal to each other, then you get a uh, nonlinear equation and the uh, frequency synchronization are exactly the zeros of this system of nonlinear uh, transcendental equations. So we are actually looking at the static picture uh, as we saw in the simulation, uh, even though this case from a dynamic system, uh, the problem of understanding synchronization really reduced down to solve a linear, uh, uh, nonlinear system. Um, the unknowns are the phase, everything else are parameters. Uh, so phase means uh, theta, theta i's. Now, of course, there are other um, issues worthy of discussion from the dynamic system side, things like stability, the, the geometry of limit cycle, and what well, their favorite bifurcations. Uh, but uh, for, for now, at least, we're mainly interested in the uh, solution to this nonlinear system. So we're looking at the static picture. Uh, there's, there's already, there are already enough open problems just here. Um, now, interestingly, this uh, system coincides almost exactly with a, a, a well, independently motivated uh, system equation called the PV type power flow equation from electric engineering, which I mentioned earlier. That, so that's describing uh, power networks, um, uh, well, alternating current power network. If you write down the laws, 
governing the, the, the power system, you get the exact same system equations, almost, uh, which is somewhat surprising. Uh, but now let's uh, uh, put these two uh, main characters together. Uh, we want to, in the next few slides, we want to see what uh, the study of symmetric etched polytope can tell us about the solution to this system nonlinear equation derived from the study of oscillator networks. Well, quite a lot. Uh, first observation is both of them are derived from the graph. So there's, so it shouldn't be completely surprising that one can inform uh, the other. Let's just list a few and we'll explain more. Uh, for example, normalize the volume of the symmetric edge polytope. So normalize so that it will be an integer, uh, actually give us a sharp, sharp upper, upper bound for the number of solutions. So if you want to know how many uh, solutions you could possibly have, well, just compute the volume. Uh, now sharp here means it's uh, attainable, but you have to go to the, the complex world. Uh, simplices in the facets. So if you look at the boundary, look at the facets. Um, and if you do simplicial subdivision of each facet, you actually get a correspondence uh, between those simplices and the in individual solutions in a very concrete way. So not only the volume is helpful for counting solutions, well, we actually have a nice concrete bijection uh, between the actual simplices uh, to the solutions. Uh, the facets give us a decomposition of the solution set. So the solution set of this nonlinear system actually coming uh, groups and the groups are naturally defined by the facets. Uh, as we'll mention later, uh, the, the, uh, a special regular subdivision of this polytope actually encodes some uh, useful information about the phenomenon called oscillator depth. So there are quite a lot of uh, connections. Oh, there are many more. I just list a few. Uh, e each of these bullet points probably uh, deserve a, a, a whole talk. Uh, so, so in the following, I will just focus on two or three uh, main points. Uh, let's start with the counting of uh, synchronization configurations. So the root counting problem. Uh, so if you start with a graph, you can ask the question, how many distinct solutions can we have? Now, those solutions have natural uh, rotational symmetry. So we, we modulo rotation. Uh, so it will become discrete points. Um, you can ask, well, if finite, we can ask uh, how many can there be? Well, I'd love to answer, have an answer to this question, but it turns out this is way too hard. Uh, at, at least in the sense that uh, to the best of my knowledge, there's no answer to this question that's easier than just solving the equation and count how many roots you have. <clears throat> uh, so this may not be the question we can answer right now, but hopefully soon. Uh, here's a better question. Uh, almost the same, just adding one word. Uh, starting from a graph, what is the maximum number of solutions uh, the system could have? So that's a more reasonable, reasonable question. Uh, so here we are, we are, we are running through, through all uh, possible choice of the parameters. Uh, again, when we count, we only count uh, isolated solutions up to a rotational symmetry. Well, we do have some answers. We have a lower bound for the maximum. So kind of lower bound for the upper, upper bound. So the lower bound is two to the n. Uh, this actually came from uh, Morse theory. So you can formulate this problem in some special cases as a problem of counting uh, critical points on the uh, n-torus. So lower bound is uh, provided by the sum of the Betty numbers. So if you add up the, the Betty numbers of uh, n-torus, you get uh, two to the n. Now this will not work when n is one, uh, that's a trivial case. You only have one oscillator. It's not really a network. We also have an upper bound. This is uh, the binomial coefficient 2n choose n. Uh, this number came from the bihomogeneous uh, Bezu number. So uh, uh, algebra geometry way of, of counting roots. Um, both of these uh, bounds came from uh, the same paper. 
Now, although uh, the two to the n, so the lower bound seems to be known uh, earlier, although I haven't seen uh, proved uh, at least not using more Morse theory. So this uh, this uh, rather old paper from 1982 uh, appeared to be the first paper that established a lot of these uh, uh, rigorously. Uh, all right, so let me rewrite this uh, carefully. So this is the equation again. The maximum uh, number of uh, solutions is trapped between uh, two to the n lower bound and two n choose n uh, the upper bound. Now there's actually a big gap between the two, uh, at least for n big, bigger than two, uh, bigger than one. <clears throat> um, so it, it turns out uh, there's a reason for this big gap, uh, both bound, both lower and upper bound are topology blind. So regardless what graph you give, uh, these two numbers, the way they compute, don't care about the graph topology. So no big surprise, there's a, there's a vast area in between uh, determined by uh, uh, graph topology. From uh, experiments we saw, uh, well, uh, people saw, I, I, not me personally, uh, the maximum number of solutions is, is highly topolog topology dependent. Indeed, those uh, two lower bounds correspond to the, the most sparse graph trees. So two to the n is for trees. And uh, two n choose n, the upper bound, is for complete graphs. So no big surprise, the lower bound and upper bound correspond to the, the most sparse yet connected graph <clears throat> and the most dense. Uh, graph. In 2016, uh, uh, a few <coughs> uh, friends of mine uh, did a very thorough numerical investigation. So they, they, they didn't, uh, 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 well, I don't think they proved this, but they did a numerical si simulation uh, and discovered many things about the topological de dependence have a lot of conjectures about the topo topological topology dependence of the root count. Uh, and they conjecture there's a uh, topology dependent upper bound uh, for the system. And, and there is. So here we can say uh, rigorously for a graph, a uh, well connected simple graph, uh, this uh, 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 equation that defines the, the synchronization configuration, so synchronization equation, is bounded above by the normalized volume of the symmetric edge polytope. So you can know the maximum number root count just by examining the, the, the polytope. This bound is also sharp if you allow complex roots. Uh, so some uh, niceness constraints. Uh, if you choose generic omega, and so, so that's the uh, natural frequency, generic but symmetric coupling. So we do require the coupling to be symmetric. The number of complex roots uh, is exactly the normalized volume of the um, uh, uh, symmetric edge polytope. So Studying the, the polytope give us a very nice bound, uh, nice in the sense that it is sharp. And I will uh, uh, talk about some improvement on this in just a moment. Uh, let's look at one simple example first. So going back this, uh, to this K3, uh, i.e. C3, the um, uh, symmetric edge polytope looks like this, the hex hexagon, we can actually see a, a, a triangulation. Each simplex has uh, well, uniform unimodular uh, triangulation. Each simplex has a normalized volume one. And this is the corresponding equation that defines the um, um, synchronization configuration. So if you count the roots, uh, you get six. And if you compute the volume, you get six. Those two are uh, exactly equal. Now this, I'm just using this as, as one example. Uh, this example is understood in the 1970s, 80s. They certainly didn't use this method to analyze this. So here, just a new, simple example. Uh, indeed, we have a stronger connection 
The synthesis you see here in this uh, triangulation actually correspond to those six solutions via a concrete uh, deformation. So we can view this as a, a, a flat family of schemes, or in my world, world, we call this a homotopy. So there's a nice numerical deformation of this system equation so that we can use the information from each simplex to not only count the solution, but actually to produce the solution. So we can actually solve the system starting from the, the triangulation uh, here. So this is a very strong connection. Uh, well, we cannot do the full proof uh, here, uh, at least not within the time constraint. So let me just sketch out the idea. We definitely want the help from algebra geometry. So the first step is turning this into an algebraic system. This system is not algebraic because the sign term, uh, but certainly uh, we, we know uh, like five different ways of turning sine cosine into algebraic uh, uh, terms and different groups have used uh, different methods. Uh, personally, I prefer uh, this formulation and then that's how we get the, the nice connection. Uh, instead of just looking at the face as a real number, we can replace that by a complex number. Uh, theta is still the face, but we have an imaginary part and uh, we can define X to be uh, the exponential of that, so basically basically a point on the uh, complex plane uh, given by the phase angle and uh, uh, a distance to origin related to R, but certainly not exactly R. All right, so uh, with this change of variable, we can get, we can turn the, 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 the sign term into a binomial, uh, well, a Laurent binomial, so a uh, binomial with negative coefficients. Uh, negative exponent, I'm sorry. Then this equation uh, involving sine term, so transcendental, uh, turned into this uh, system of uh, algebraic equation, so system of Laurent polynomial, uh, pol Laurent polynomial system. Now, if you look at this way, then the uh, symmetry edge to polytope is exactly the convex hull of the union of the Newton polytopes of each of these. Hence the connection, right? So um, if we go one step further, what you want to do is to apply the cushion Nurenko theorem, uh, Bernstein theorem to bound the number of roots of this uh, Laurent polynomial system by this uh, Newton polytope. Okay, so at least that will establish uh, upper bound. So the fact that this serve as upper bound is probably no surprise. Uh, the relatively, well, the slightly non-trivial part is to show uh, this bound is also exact. Yeah, after all, uh, there, are, there are few relaxation. So, it's, so here we're taking the convex hull but union of Newton polytope, which is not, it's different from just the polytope, uh, Newton polytope. So right there is, is one relaxation. Another one is the, the, the coefficients are related. Uh, each pair of this monomial uh, share the same coefficients. So even if you can choose this coupling coefficient generically, these two are still tied together. So they're not truly generic. So generic root count doesn't, doesn't work here. So we have to show basically the Bernstein uh, generalness. Uh, it is the coefficients are not generic, but as far as root count is concerned, can still reach this, right? So that's the, the sketch of this, this idea uh, behind that, that, that root count result. Based on that, we have concrete formulas for uh, the root count, which is very helpful in, in any kind of computation, numerical simulation, um, because our, uh, very often when you want to solve a system, you need to know the root count first. Um, for complete graphs, trees, cycles, uh, odd cycles, glue together long edges, odd wheels, even wheels, and, and many more. So uh, I just picked the results I can fit on one slide and there are definitely uh, a few more. And I haven't checked recently, there could be uh, new papers coming out. So, uh, basically, a lot of root counting results, not from uh, the numerical world, but uh, from the world of, of polytopes. 
<clears throat> well, what about real root counts then? <laughs> uh, uh, people in dynamic system don't actually care about. Okay, so I may take that back. I, I I have a few slides at the end. Hopefully, will change their mind. Um, but if that fails, uh, they don't care about complex roots. They care about real roots correspond to the the, the real dynamic. Uh, recall this uh, this result is is for complex roots. Uh, but we we do have some uh, improvement. In some cases, it worked for real roots two uh that some cases is it's a very small subset let me list a few uh for complete uh graph k3 only k3 the maximum root count real root is six complex also six so these two coincide right? exactly so all real roots uh, well all complex roots could be real for trees of any size it works for cycles of any size, it works. Uh, I think it is still unknown if this is true for K4. Uh, so even some very simple cases, well, we don't know. Uh, um, <clears throat> right, so uh, these results are from uh, these two papers uh, of which I'm not directly involved. <clears throat> Uh, in general, could the maximum uh, number of real roots equal the maximum number of complex roots, which is given by the normalized volume for graphs other than trees and cycles? Uh, well, unfortunately, at this point, we don't know. Uh, I, I see some uh, 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 some um, some signs of breakthrough, so we'll, we'll, I, I may have to change this slide very soon. Uh, for now, uh, we don't know. <clears throat> well, so far, we only talk about the maximum. Uh, the, the actual number of root count is uh, could be lower than maximum, and that's a hard problem to figure out. Uh, so let's see, when is maximum not achieved? So this is a natural question to ask. Uh, how, well, under what kind of choices uh, could the uh, root count drop below maximum and uh, even better if we can understand uh, drop by how much? The second part of the question, we don't have a good, we don't have a very good answer, but for the first part, we do. Uh, so we can look at the missing roots from the view, from the point of view of ex exceptional coupling. Uh, so we focus on the effect of the coupling coefficient uh, it turns out that's the only thing that matters. Uh, so here we can first apply a simple SARS theorem for generic choices of the omegas. So that's the constant term. That's the natural frequency. Uh, all roots will be isolated and regular. No big surprise. So we can actually count. And not only that, that this count will be somewhat stable. Uh, <clears throat> And it will also help us to avoid uh, the discussion of multiplicity, make things slightly easier. Uh, so let's phrase this uh, problem carefully. Uh, under the assumption of generic uh, omega, uh, focus on the coupling coefficient, Kij, uh, what are the choices that will make the actual root count smaller than the generic root count? We can focus on the complex roots uh, because that actually apply to real roots as well. Let's call these the exceptional coupling. So exceptional in the sense that they have fewer roots than uh, the generic choices. Well, so here I have a slide that's not intended to be read, uh, copy and paste from our paper. It's a very complicated statement. Uh, well, we basically have a complicated description of the uh, coupling uh, coefficients. If the coupling coefficient satisfies this equation, then the root count will drop strictly below the maximum. Uh, the main takeaway here, so the main point of this, uh, well, uh, not intend to be read uh, slide, is that the description of the exceptional uh, uh, coupling coefficients actually came from uh, certain type of sub digraphs of G, which in turn came from the facial complex. So each of this, so this 
There are many equations like this. Each of the equation came from a phase of the symmetric edge polytope. Uh, this also should come in no big surprise. Uh, indeed, this is um, how uh, Bernstein theorem was proved. Um, so we are, we are, we are uh, basically writing down the explicit conditions uh, for each of those uh, degeneracy conditions. Uh, sort of in a similar way, uh, you can write down the set of all except exceptional coupling coefficients in terms of the union of co exceptional coupling coefficients from a bridgeless, maximally bipartite, uh, well, maximum bipartite, bipartite subgraphs in their own induced subgraphs. Uh, and the, we have the same message here. The main takeaway is those in turn came from the, the facial complex of the uh, symmetry edged polytope. So again, uh, the study of a symmetry edged polytope inform us uh, how to write down all these things. So here is more concrete example of C4, four cycle. Uh, we have four coupling coefficients on the four edges. And uh, here's the proposition. The root count will be strictly less than 12. That's the normalized volume. If and only if one or more of these uh, equations hold. Uh, of course, we assume they're non-zero, so they're all defined. So three conditions, and they can they can combine with one another, uh, describe all the uh, um, exceptional coupling coefficients. Well, how do we get those three equations? They came from three um, uh, sub digraphs. Yeah. Uh, actually, six. They come in conjugate pairs. What are those come from? Well, they in turn came from the the six. Uh, pairs of six antipathy uh, and antipathy pairs of facets of the symmetric edge polytope. So there's a natural symmetry of the, the facets. They always uh, form in, uh, antipathy uh, pairs, and each pair contribute to one of this equation. So again, we write down or we, we figure out what are the facets, and those facets tell us exactly how to write down those equations. Well, switch gear one more time. Uh, sort of similar thing, similar construction also give us uh, non-isolated uh, synchronization configurations. So those are the configurations with at least one degree of freedom, not counting the rotational freedom, uh, the, the natural rotational symmetry. There are many uh, examples of these uh, uh, discovered, I guess, fairly recently. Uh, sort of the most uh, uh, notable, uh, this uh, paper from uh, uh, Scolosa, uh, very recently, uh, still on archive, uh, says something very strong. Indeed, for any integer d, you can construct a, a Chrome model network uh, whose, well, uh, he called that the stable equilibria, so correspond to our uh, synchronization configuration. Uh, of dimension D. So the dimension can be arbitrarily large. Uh, I don't think this is an expected result. I, I think this is somewhat surprising. Uh, so basically, uh, non-isolated synchronization configuration, well, it is, it's probably more interesting than people originally thought. So worthy of uh, a discussion. Uh, looking at the C4 example again, same example, uh, we can write down three different one dimensional components of uh, synchronization configuration. Well, those three, well, the, the number uh, is, is three again, uh, no big surprise. It came from the, the six uh, facets, uh, three antipathy pairs uh, of facets of the symmetry edge polytope. So again, uh, polytope, symmetry edge polytope, tell us exactly how to write down this. The formula is not very important, just the fact that I can write down exactly those three using the, uh, the, the polytope information. Uh, in general, the way we construct this kind of positive dimensional solution is, is interesting to me. 
So here is a, a sort of complicated theorem. Uh, we have some complicated formula. Now you intend to be read carefully. Uh, but basically we have a formula to write down one dimensional orbits, uh, well, at least one dimensional orbits of complex components of the synchronization configuration. And uh, in all of them, they also contain one real dimensional, a uh, one, one dimensional real orbits. Uh, this only works for uh, even cycle. Uh, I will talk about some extension on this as well. Certainly this requires further explanation, uh, but the main point is again, uh, this, uh, well, all the symbols here, uh, this uh, eta, this, this t, and this map itself are actually parameterized by pairs of facets. So each pair of antipathy, each antipathy point, uh, pairs of a facet give you one one dimensional parameterization. So here I uh, we use logarithm just to make sure we have this uh, natural um, um, well, uh, modular the unit circle. So same story again. Facets tell us how to parameterize one dimensional orbits. Sort of the same message I repeated uh, five times. <clears throat> it does go beyond uh, cycles. Uh, well, I, I forgot to mention in the previous uh, uh, example, you can actually uh, attach trees to cycles, it still work. So any kind of uh, uh, unit cycle graph, uh, uh, uni even cycle graph still work. If you glue two cycles along a shared edge, the same idea still work, although the formula is more complicated. Just to give you one example with six nodes, two, four cycles, uh, we can write down a simple solution. The formula is probably not very important. The point is if you plug in uh, all the equation balance, so you have a sort of one degree of freedom of synchronization configuration. You can move quite a bit, everything's still synchronized. Uh, in general, uh, you can have any number of even cycles glue along the same edge. So they only share a single edge. And uh, if the uh, coupling coefficient satisfies certain conditions, uh, then we have at least one dimensional real and complex components in the synchronization configuration. Um, slightly more complicated uh, formula, but same message nonetheless. Uh, pairs of facets tell us exactly how to parameterize those uh, orbits. Um, well, uh, so, so far we have gone through quite a few things. Uh, so I should go back. So maybe repeat the final um, message one more time. So, uh, so far we're talking about how facets are useful. So, so far we're looking at outside the surface of the uh, symmetry edge polytope. The, the geometry inside also is important. Now there's really not much geometry inside. Uh, the the uh, symmetry edge polytope contains just one interior lattice point, uh, but we can still do uh, regular uh, uh, subdivisions, regular triangulations, and those cells actually tell their, their own stories. So to do that, let's go one step further. Uh, so this is a, just a toy model, um, not intend to be, uh, not 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 modeling anything uh, real. Um, that add one more equation. So we have the phase, um, we have the differential equation governing the phase, just like the Crow model model, so that's line one. And we also add in the redial interaction. So not only do they push and pull each other in the direction uh, perpendicular to the to the circle, but also they pull in and out of the uh, well. They pull each other uh, in the direction towards or away from the the origin. That's the second equation. Rho is used for uh, the redial um, position. So these two equations are very similar to the uh, Cromwell equation. Uh, there's some nice symmetry to that. Uh, so here, each x i is a point. Uh, using the uh, well, almost polar coordinates. Uh, theta i is still the uh, the the base angle. Rho i is uh, well, is related to the magnitude. Uh, 
indeed rho i is negative of a natural log of the, the absolute value. So that measures the uh, readout uh, position in the logarithm scale. So here's a picture of interaction. Not only they pull each other in the in the um, phase direction, but they also pull each other or push on each other on the readout direction. <clears throat> it, I want to call this toric amplitude oscillator because we add in an amplitude component, toric because they actually they naturally live in the algebraic torus of C star n. Uh, we're taking away the zero, taking away the infinity. So basically it's like for model model, except they're no longer locked on this circular track. We allow them to move, move around freely on the plane. Uh, well, of course, under the constraints. Well, we just like how we define a uh, synchronization configuration, we can define something called the locking configuration. The, the, the name of this term is, uh, well, uh, we could maybe choose some different terms, but I think this is sort of fitting. Um, and here's, uh, here's my definition. Uh, if you, for the first equation, if you use reach some kind of equilibrium like the chromodal sense, so in terms of the phase direction, it's the same as the chromodal equation. On the readout di direction, you also reach some kind of equilibrium um, relative to zero. By the way, zero means the unit circle. So they reach some kind of equilibrium relative to the, to the uh, well, uh, around the unit circle. Uh, if both of these are satisfied, we call this a locked configuration or locking configuration uh, because it is locked in the sense they become a static picture as well. Um, up to a rotational and a scaling symmetry. So this is a similar definition. Uh, we just uh, extend into the readout direction as well. Uh, I would say this is a natural uh, extension and it may be useful in some situations. Uh, the, the, the type of amplitude oscillator is certainly not new. People have come up with all different uh, models for these kind of things and this is just uh, uh, one variation of that. Well, uh, this model allow us to apply the uh, the the, um, um, the polytope equation connection more directly. So if you just choose your uh, generic uh, parameters, uh, the isolated, uh, so the locked configuration are isolated and regular, and the total number is exactly the normalized volume. So this is a more direct connection. Because we allow them to, to roam around uh, freely on the plane, we're no longer restricted to the circle, we have a more direct uh, connection. Uh, indeed, all the complex routes that this uh, normalized volume counts are actually correspond to uh, locking configurations in this uh, model. Uh, well, by itself, this model may not be very interesting. What will make it interesting is the time-dependent parameter. So the question is, what will happen if we allow uh, the coupling coefficient to change over time? Uh, we tweak the Kij to be stronger or weaker as a function of time, t. So this is also a very natural question to ask. People have studied this. Indeed, this is a much more important question in the uh, core model uh, uh, world. Uh, well, to start with, we have we definitely have local continuity, uh, and there's small change changes. Uh, no big surprise. The log configuration. So if you change your your coupling coefficient a little bit, uh, make it stronger or weaker by tightening a little bit, the log configuration will also move a little bit to fit the new constraint. No big surprise. Uh, after all, you can get it from implicit function theorem uh, or the local you know, local uniformization uh, theorem of, of uh, uh, analytic of variety. Uh, um, so this is no big surprise. The global picture well, is a little bit complicated and interesting, uh, complicated in, in the interesting way. Uh, the oscillators may die in the, in the following sense. Uh, so this is the, still the equation. We may define amplitude depth uh, of the moving locked configuration, a time-dependent moving 
uh, lock configuration as the condition that row, which is the redial uh, position, goes to positive or negative infinity. Uh, so what does that mean? Recall that row equals to the natural uh, negative of natural log of the absolute value. So this condition actually uh, says it either goes to zero, so the amplitude actually goes to zero or infinity. So the real amplitude is the absolute value of, of x. That's how far away it is from the origin. If it goes to zero, the oscillator really cease to be oscillator. It's no longer uh, going around the circle anymore. Uh, to infinity is sort of the same phenomenon. There's a natural symmetry uh, around the circle. So it's going to infinity is actually same as going to zero. So both of them, the oscillator in both conditions, the oscillator are no longer oscillators. Uh, I think we can call this oscillator death. <clears throat> we can also consider partial death in which uh, uh, some, but not all oscillators die. So some of us remain oscillators, uh, some die. Uh, so partial death. So certainly uh, the, the amplitude death is not a, a concept I, I, I come out with. Uh, this is well studied in the dynamical world. Uh, we borrow this into this context because I think this is a, a nice uh, algebraic version of the same phenomenon. Uh, well, maybe they will disagree, uh, we'll see. So uh, I do think uh, it, it, this is a concept that sort of makes sense here, but more importantly, it is useful. It is useful in the following sense. Now the detail is a little bit complicated, so I can only give you the, the bullet points. This is sort of ongoing project. We don't have a uh, published paper yet, but hopefully we're close uh, to uh, send, uh, posting something on the, on the archive. Uh, this is a project uh, my, my student and, and, and I are, are working on uh, currently. Uh, just to uh, give you uh, some bullet points, uh, if, if all uh, coupling coefficient goes to zero, so we're basically changing the coupling coefficient so that they're no longer there. Uh, well, we have to do this in the same asymptotic rate. So if you do that, then all locked configuration converts to amplitude depth or partial depth. Uh, here I use the word convert uh, because I have some compatibilization in mind. You can certainly say diverge because they go to infinity in some sense. Okay, so they all die. This part is no big surprise, um, but what's important here is, uh, well, again, uh, the, um, the relative rate, so if you look at how they die, so how they go to infinity, and if you look at the, well, they all go to infinity, but if you look at the relative rate, you get a vector, and that vector is actually collinear to a normal vector uh, of a facet of this uh, symmetric edge particle. Uh, to say this in a better way, if you if you if you normalize your your facet vec uh, normal vectors nicely, or you can you can know the relative rate uh, at which those row goes to infinity. Uh, so you can describe exactly how they die based on the facets. Uh, so. Let me go back a little bit. So here uh, sort of looks like the same message, but it's actually by accident. Uh, in general, it's not really about facet anymore. If uh, only some of the coupling coefficient go to zero, then generically speaking, some locked configuration converts to amplitude depth. And uh, um, the relative rate of those, those depth are determined by cells in some very special regular uh, subdivisions of the uh, symmetric edge top particle. So not only the facets or faces tell us something important, uh, there's a way to construct a uh, regular subdivision. Uh, the, 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 the weights are related to how you uh, take the, the k case to zero. Um, and that setup, uh, the, the cells uh, of, of a, a subdi regular subdivision also describe how uh, oscillators die. So the takeaway is, or if you know, want to know how oscillator die, you look at the same thing, the polytope. Now, uh, by itself, this may not look very useful, but if, if you can imagine running the time in reverse, 
this will become useful. Uh, if you know how they die and running the time in reverse, you can resurrect them. Uh, so this gives us a new way of computing those uh, missing solutions uh, using the polytope information. So here I'm uh, giving a sort of vague bullet point because this is sort of a still ongoing project. Uh, I hope to have a, a more, uh, uh, well, a better description very soon. Well, in summary, uh, symmetric edge polytope tell us a lot about the core model, model uh, maximum number of configuration, synchronization configurations, how to compute the exceptional couplings, uh, how to construct non-isolated configurations, uh, describing how they die in the amplitude oscillator model. And of course, there are a few more points that I, I don't have time to, to get into here. So, uh, well, I think it's fair to say quite a lot. We can know quite a lot uh, by just looking at the polytope. Well, some final thoughts. Uh, symmetric edge polytope is the main is one of the main character, but uh, in, in this world, well, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are more general construction. So in general, if you start with, uh, with a graph or, or diagram or finite quiver, uh, you represent by some labeled uh, edge and loop list. Uh, you can consider any kind of function that map uh, edges or loops to lattice polytopes. And you, you um, consider the, the convex hull of the, uh, the union of all those little polytopes derived from edges. Uh, you get something else that's similar and useful in the same way, uh, but for other models. Uh, so we may want to call this adjacency polytope, or we, <clears throat> we have seen this kind of constructions, depending on your choice of how you construct those little polytopes from edges, uh, play similar roles in other models. Uh, right now, uh, in, in my research in electric engineering, we're looking at power flow equations of different type uh, that, that requires adjacency polytope um, that has different uh, constructions. So uh, quite a lot to be explored. Um, well, I uh, uh, hopefully the, I share some interesting uh, connections and uh, worthy of discussion and certainly look forward to, to hear your uh, comments or suggestions or, or criticism. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, with that, I, I thank you so much for your kind attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's first of all, thank the speaker. Uh, are there any questions? So this is uh, connected all to the study of amplitudehedral. So people in string theory look at, uh, um, look at polytopes to, to model uh, and compute scattering amplitudes. It feels kind of similar, but uh, I don't know. Is it? Have you looked at it? Uh, I have not, but I do know quite a few people who have. So certainly similar uh, polytopes uh, uh, come up uh, from string theory, theory like the uh, Kalabi-Yao connection and uh, um, um, yeah, so I, I think I know what you're talking about. I don't remember the reference right now, but yeah, uh, there are quite a few similar constructions uh, from physics. And of course, this uh, this pro model e e equation itself uh, is is derived from from the physics world. So all, long ago, it is it, it has some quantum me me mechanics uh, origin. So is this step by a regular triangulations? Is it necessary? I'm sorry. And many polytopes. Many polytopes. I mean, uh, there might not be a nice. I mean, there might not be canonical regular triangulations. Is it necessary to go by a regular triangulation? Hmm. Well, certainly in 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 the model I have studied, yes, yeah. But yeah, like, like I point out at the, at the end that you can construct different versions uh, to apply to different models, then it will be different. Okay. Questions from anyone else? I mean, I, okay, I, Arena, you're the, the, the master of disaster. Thank you. And any more questions? 
I have some big general questions. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, thanks for an interesting talk. So I guess the uh, sort of big general questions is that, okay, for th these specific kinds of oscillator equations, you look at the connections to like invariances and, and subdivisions of certain polytopes. Are they, do you know like what classes of like differential equations would like make sense to approach in this sort of way? So I guess I just haven't seen a lot, a lot of results in this sort of direction. Although, okay, maybe one thing I've seen relating like combinatorial properties of like differential equations, like solutions to differential equations, like for example, like a lot of volumes on KB silicons, but I, I don't think that's quite related to all this kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, well, any anytime you have algebraic equations, then polytope would come in naturally uh -huh. in the form of yeah. Newton polytopes or uh -huh. a construction of Tory varieties. Uh, but in this uh, situation, certainly uh, anytime you have a network derived uh, differential equation, it, it probably come out very naturally because, uh, well, you, you, you have a, well, it, it is the, the differential equation is, is, if the differential equation is derived from some graphs, then there must be some way of extracting the information in a discrete form. So be that a polytope or some, some other things. So uh, something like this come out will be will be quite natural at least now it seems. Uh, so I have seen some uh, studying like a social network, uh, and that's interesting, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, coming up with different people come out with different models, and there's a was well, in some cases they go back to the symmetry edge polytope. Uh, sometimes it's the the directed version of the symmetry, so directed edge polytope. And sometimes it's um, uh, something similar. So yeah, uh, yeah. Certainly, when whenever you you derive some model from graph, uh, I think it's 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 worth our time to look at the the, the corresponding polytope. Okay, thanks. I guess also when you can build some kind of new polytope, you'll probably get something on the trail. Yeah, and uh, uh, just in the in the pure algebraic sense, there's some uh, construction like Cordo ideal. Uh, I remember there's there's something similar called the edge polytope showing up there. So um, which which is different from symmetry edge polytope. Uh, so yeah, uh, it it show up there as well. Yeah, well, you whenever you have some kind of graph showing up, yeah, the, there may be some polytope hiding behind it. Are there any more questions? If not, I can at least stop the recording.